turn our Bibles, please, to Psalm 2. Last time I preached here, it was the far end of the Psalter, Psalm 130. Now we're going to look at a psalm from the beginning of the Psalter, Psalm chapter 2. I will read it, pray, and then we'll start. I'm reading out of the New King James. I could read out of the... Uh, I'm just going to stay with the New King. It's, it's pretty close. Psalm 2 in your Bibles, 12 verses. Why do the nations, or you could render it Gentiles, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds and pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distrust them in his deep displeasure. Yet, or as for me, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Let's pray. Father, it's one of the most important words you have ever spoken, New or Old Testament. It teaches us your plan for the ages. It teaches us somewhat of who you are. And it teaches us how we should respond to who you are. Now, Father, I pray this afternoon that you would help me, weak, heavy laden, not all that clear, weary. And yet, Father, I know that it's not my strength, it's not my intellect, and it's not my vigor that's important. It's yours. So please come, Father, I beg you even tonight. I beg you to come in a powerful way, that you would aid my words, and that you would invigorate and enliven my words by your Spirit's power. Besides that, we have no hope tonight. It'll just be a lifeless discourse, and that we don't want. We love you, and we thank you, and we praise you for your holy word that gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. came uh, from the nursing home um, straight from the uh, deathbed of a Christian lady who was hours away from dying with her daughter. And as I was riding down here uh, in the car, of course I was praising God that he would count me faithful to be involved with such a ministry as that. And secondly, it made me realize how desperate we are and how crucial it is that we take God seriously and take him seriously 
now. We don't have any time. And therefore, preaching and teaching the Word of God becomes a critical and pressure-packed assignment. We, we, we don't dare just speak words of instruction and hope that we get a little bit smarter. What we want to do is to prepare ourselves for that day. And all of us will experience that day. It's coming. As this lady Rose was lying on her deathbed, so one day I shall also be lying on mine. And the only question that's ever going to matter is, am I ready? And so as we look at Psalm 2, I hope that the urgency of that day is impressed upon your souls. In 1938, October 30th to be exact, a burgeoning uh, actor and broadcaster by the name of Orson Welles broadcasted what was called a show, The War of the Worlds. That's many years ago, and maybe some of you have never heard of it, so let me explain what happened that evening in October of 1938. Orson Welles spoke as if what he was saying was true, and he talked about an invasion from outer space that was attacking the world and was soon to completely put the world under its sway. In other words, the world was about to be conquered and demolished and destroyed. Now, certainly the people that put on this broadcast thought that most people would understand it was just a story. But alas, many did not. And it caused quite a large amount of confusion in America as people started to run the streets wondering what was happening and looking in the sky and worrying about when they were going to die and looking for these Martians and others that were coming down to take them over. It, it caused panic in the streets in places like New York City. And later on, the newspapers talked about the wars of the world and, and eventually as the next day dawned it came to be known by many that this was simply a story, it was a ruse, it wasn't meant to be taken seriously. And I'd like to propose to you tonight that although that was a story that was certainly fictional and meant to be a fiction story, although it was taken differently, there is a war of the world in the Bible that is not fictional but is absolutely real. It's happening right now as we speak. And it's one that we need to know about as believers. Right at the moment we preach, at this very moment tonight, on May the 27th in 2018, there is a war going on. What war might you say? I would like to say that this psalm tells us what that war is. And so I want to simply outline the psalm very simply for you tonight so you can kind of get bite-sized pieces of how it's structured and then we're going to look at this war and hopefully we're going to end with a great encouragement. But the book doesn't start that way. So first of all, what we want to look at tonight is the first heading will be the nations at war with God, verses 1 through 3. And then the center of the psalm, which uh, often in Hebrew literature, the center is the climax, verses 4 through 9, we want to look at God at war with the nations. So the nations at war with God, God at war with the nations, and then finally in verses 10 through 12, God at peace with the nations. God at war with the nations, or the nations at war with God, God at war with the nations, uh, subtitle 2, and then... God at peace with the nations. Well, let's start with verses 1 through 3. The nations at war with God. And again, notice the, uh, the symmetry of the psalm. Verses 1 through 3, the first three are one section. The last three verses are another section. And then the middle is the climax. So it breaks down very easily for us. 
the nations at war with God. Now, this is a war that's going on right as we speak. Notice what it says. He asks a question, the psalmist does. And by the way, we don't know who wrote this. It's not attributed to David. It could have been David, but I doubt it, because if you look at the circumstances of the psalm, it seems to be a king who was, uh, who was surrounded by enemies and being attacked. And I don't know if that would fit the life of David or not. But who was, whoever wrote the psalm, it doesn't matter. It was some Hebrew, probably a king or a king's associate. Why do the heathens rage is the question. And the people plot a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. This section tells us that the nations are intensely in opposition against God. I want you to notice a few things about this intense opposition against God. And the psalmist is asking, why is this so? Why do the nations rise up with such hatred towards their maker? Well, several things we see in the text. Number one, we see that it's, a, it's an intense rage. It says, why do the nations rage? And, and rage, and this word in the Hebrew talks about an apoplectic kind of rage where, where your, bodily, uh, uh, your body is literally shaking with anger. Why are the nations raising and people blotting, plotting rather than blotting, plotting vain things? It's an intense rage. Secondly, we see that it's a universal rage. This isn't talking about one nation, the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Moabites or whoever. This is talking about a universal rage of the nations against God. The kings of the earth set themselves, align themselves. It's a military concept. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Now we'll get in a second to what this is all about with the Lord and his anointed. Literally, it's Yahweh and his Mashiach. Yahweh and his Messiah. But thirdly, let us look also in verse 3 that it's a rebellious, a rebellious rage or a rage of rebellion. What is their cry? What is it that they're raging against? They're raging against the fact that God has them in bonds. Let us break their, plural, that is the Lord Yahweh and Mashiach, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So just at the outset, we see that the nations, and this is talking, I think, about redemptive history. This is for all time, especially in the context of what the psalm is saying, the time from Mashiach on, the nations are raging. It's an intense rage. It's a universal rage. And it's a rebellious rage. I think most of us don't see that. We look at the world and we're always clamoring for world peace. We're figuring some kind of diplomacy here and some kind of treaty there will keep the nations relatively in line. But this section of this Psalm is telling us that the nations are right now in a state of rage against God. That's scary. Who specifically and what actually is precipitating this rage? And this is where we go back to verse 2 and, and uh, the second part, B, 2B. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord, Yahweh, and against his Messiah. It seems to be that the rage of the nations is coterminant with the coming of this one called the Messiah. In other words, what's, what's precipitating the rage is this one called the Anointed One. Now we know in the Old Testament an anointed one could be a king, it could be a prophet, it could be a priest. Anybody that was set apart for a specific duty with the oil pouring down their head could be called the anointed one. 
But as we'll find out very soon in the New Testament, this is a messianic psalm which is pointing forward not only to whoever it is that wrote this psalm, but more specifically and more poignantly to somebody who would come later called the capital A anointed one. And it seems that this anointed one, the installation of this one called the anointed one, is what is precipitating the rage of the nations. And so this is an anti-messianic rage. As a matter of fact, if you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, you will find that this is exactly how the apostles viewed it. Now, by the way, this psalm is quoted at least five times in the New Testament. It's one of those psalms that the New Testament writers can't get away from because it so clearly points to the Messiah. You remember the story in Acts 4, uh, uh, Peter and John have been arrested for preaching the gospel near the, the, uh, the temple, and they've been quizzed, and they've been questioned, and finally they're let go. They were threatened in verse 21, telling them, don't do this anymore, and they had uh, raised this uh, sick man who had been 40 years uh, on a bed, and they raised him up to healing, and of course the whole nation, or the whole city specifically, is in an uproar because of what's going on with this apostolic ministry. And then in verse 23, we pick up the story, and being let go, that is the apostles, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard, the, <clears throat> when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who, by the mouth of your servant David, now that's interesting because that indicates maybe David wrote it, but that's not necessarily true because sometimes the Psalms are just uh, are equally called David, so, so that could or could not mean anything. But anyway, in according to Psalm 2, why did the he heathens rage? And the people plot vain things. The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Now notice how the apostles uh, interpret this verse out of Psalm 2. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, that's the same root as Mashiach, anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose deter determined before to be done. In other words, what the apostles are saying is that we are witnessing the, the fulfillment of Psalm 2 where the nations are rising up against the Lord and against his Mashiach right here, right now in the Jerusalem square as we're preaching the gospel. And notice the thing that got them enraged was the fact that they were preaching Jesus. Back in verse 18, we read, So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. You see, what gets the nations enraged is not simply our talking about God. Men in general do not get upset when you talk about God. Why? Why? Because most men intrinsically believe in some higher power of some kind. And when you use the word God, it's simply an empty box into which they can spill any thought they want to to make the God of their own choosing. They're not threatened by the name God. But when you talk about Jesus, the resurrected one, the way, the truth, the life, the only way that God can accept sinners. That God, the, the God who has the Messiah named Jesus, that's the God that they rage against. And you see it here in Acts chapter 4. Had the apostles just walked around that day and said, hey, everybody needs to get right with God. They all believed in God. They all said, well on, brother. We all need to get right with God. We need to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbors that are so. They would have believed all of that. 
Oh, but once you add in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the only true Messiah, the one who emptied that grave and sits at the right hand of the Father, they wanted no part of that. So it was an intense rage, a universal rage, a rebellious rage, and an anti-messianic rage. Now at this point we have to kind of take a little bit discursus and, and, and think about why is it that there is such a rage against God and his Messiah? Why specifically is it God and his Messiah that causes the nations to rebel openly and aggressively against God? That's the question. Well, the reason is because way back in Genesis 3.15, and we're going through Genesis, a promise was given that one would come from the seed of the woman and would, who would crush, a man would crush the head of the seed of serpent the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the serpent would bruise the heel of the one that would come. In other words, this is just a, an extension, a manifestation of Genesis 3.15, that there's going to be this cosmic war throughout history, and especially in the coming of the Messiah, that will, that will categorize all of history until Jesus comes back again. And so what I want to say to you is that it's at the cross of Jesus Christ that all the rage really begins. You can go back into the Old Testament and you can see that, yes, the nations seem to be against God, but there didn't seem to be that raging against it that we find once Messiah comes, dies, empties the tomb, and rises again from the dead and is preached. Then the rage really seems to take off. As a matter of fact, it's hinted several places in the Bible that in the Old Testament it was, it was rather banal. The, the rage of the nations was, that really wasn't there. The reason for that is very simple. Because when you don't upset anybody with something that goes against them, you're not going to provoke their rage. Just think of somebody that you know that's very touchy. And you can get along with them really well so long as you don't bring up certain subjects, Right? But you bring up that one subject and the rage comes out. Well, because the subject of Messiah was never coming out, nor was Israel doing its job of, of proselytizing the nations, there was never the rage against the, the, the Messiah that we see once Jesus comes. So, so Paul, for example, will say to the Athenians, truly God... Uh, uh, these times of ignorance God overlooked these times of ignorance but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day at which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he's ordained and has given assurance of all this by the raising of him from the dead now when they heard that Listen to what the Athenians did. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. It's the, it's the coming of the resurrection and the, what we call the passion and death of the Messiah and the preaching thereof that causes, according to Psalm 2, the rage of the nations. So again, in verse 2b, it says, against the Lord, Yahweh, and against his anointed. But then the question must also be asked, why is it such an intense fight? And the reason for that is because when Messiah finally comes, the rage of the nations is now going to be embodied and strengthened and energized by a different kind of spirit. We call him Satan. I remember way back a while ago a reading about the uh, Daniel chapter 8, the, uh, the, the establishment of, of, um, of the kingdom. And it says in 823 of Daniel, and in the latter time of their kingdom when the transgressors have reached their fullness, and the king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty. And this is talking about not God. This is, this is talking about Satan. His power shall be mighty, 
but not by his own power. That's talking about this evil king will be energized by somebody outside of himself that will give him power. And so we find in the Bible that when Jesus Christ, the Messiah, finally comes, the activity of Satan goes off the charts. And so I just want to give you a couple verses to show that indeed there is this cosmic struggle between the forces of Messiah, the forces of good, and the forces of evil, which are energized by the devil himself. And this is a real fight. It's a real fight. It's going on right now. And alas, many don't even see the fight at all. So, for example, Luke 10, 17, when Jesus sees uh, the, the 70 coming back with rejoicing and preaching the gospel, he says he saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven. There seems to have been a time at the time of Jesus' death when Satan was thrown out of heaven and became the prince of the power of the air. He gains a modicum of control over the earth. John 12, verses 31 and 32, Jesus says, Now is the ruler of this world, uh, world uh, destroyed, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. You see where Jesus is linking that the ruler of the world is being destroyed at his cross, at the cross work of Jesus Christ. You can read about the demise of Satan in Isaiah 14, where he's brought down to Sheol, down to the lower pits of the earth. You can read that for yourself. I'll turn your attention to Revelation chapter 12 to show again that this theme of Satan now becoming enraged with the crucifixion and the installation of Messiah as the head of all creation, he becomes enraged and enrages the nations. And it says in verse 7 of Revelation 12, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. See, they're, they're, they're dismissed out of heaven. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. And he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then verse 10, it talks about uh, the, uh, the fight that they have. He's the accuser of the brethren and the saints. In verse 11, overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. And notice in verse 12, Satan's attitude in this whole thing is at the end of the verse, it says, he knows that he has a short time. Now, I believe that's talking about the age that we're in now. That Satan, because of the, uh, of the facts of the cross, the messianic victory at Calvary, that Satan being cast out of heaven through the, and, and the, through the preaching of the gospel and so on, uh, is now enraged and is building up that rage against God and all of his people. And then lastly, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15, we read the Apostle Paul saying uh, this, Having, that's talking about the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them in it, so let no one judge you in food or drink or regard of a festival or a new moon or shadows. In other words, Psalm 2, I believe, is telling us that at the installation of the Messiah, when, when God brought his Messiah into the world, allowed him to die on a cross, raised him again the third day, and then installed him in heaven as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Then the fun started. Then the war really took off. Then the heat of the battle really came to a peak. We are in it right now. Do you realize we are in a war as the church of Jesus Christ right now, and it is a war to the death. So many Christians are sleepwalking. Rise, you sleeper, and Christ will give you light, Paul says to the Ephesians. We cannot sleep. This is a war where the nations are raging against the Lord and his Messiah, and Satan does not give up, and neither must we. So it's an intense rage, a universal rage, a rebellious rage, an anti-messianic rage, and, an, and a spiritually empowered rage 
The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords. You know, the one thing nobody wants in any of the nations, anybody that's not a Christian, the one thing they don't want is God ruling their lives. Somebody once wrote, I think it was uh, George Marshall, I'm not sure. Somebody wrote this once and said that in, in, in hell, the one thing that everybody will say is that they had to do it their way. That, that would be the one underlying theme of everybody that is cast away out of the presence of God. They had to do it their way. They didn't want the yoke of God. They didn't want the discipline of God. They didn't want the commandments of God. They didn't want God. They were the captain of their own soul. And God, of course, had to dismiss them forever. You don't want me. I don't want you. Secondly, God at war with the nations. The nations are at war with God. Now we see in the psalm, God now turns around and he's at war with the nations. So let's look at that. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Verse 4, the Lord shall hold them in derision. He'll mock them. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them with his deep displeasure. Yet, or as for me, or now, I have set my king on my holy hill, Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with the rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. You know, at, at this point in the psalm, all we're seeing is war. They had declared war on God. Now he's declaring war on the nations. This should frighten us to the bottom of our souls. Notice the kind of thing that the Lord does as he comes against the nations. The first thing he does is scoff. Verse 4. He who sits in eleven uh, is in eleven. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. God knows, we know, they don't know that God is powerful, that he laughs at this feeble attempt by the nations to overcome him and his Messiah. They have no hope in this conflict. There's absolutely no way that they can win, and he therefore derides them for their pompous self-sufficiency. It says, He who sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. And then it talks about the wrath of that he now will execute against them. Isn't it interesting that they have wrath against God? Verse 1. And now God has wrath against them. Verse 5. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. And so God will scoff them, but worse than that, he will execute his wrath against the nations. Now we don't see that much yet, and we'll find out why. But, but often God does. I mean, look at all the, the things that are happening in nations across the world, across the globe, including America. A lot of that is the overflow of God's wrath against the nations. Now God is merciful, and we're going to talk about that at the end. But let's not one second diminish the fact that God is not happy with those who conspire against them and shake their fists and say, we don't want any part of you. We want to be free. There is no such thing as being free. You're bound to something. No man can have two masters. And then let's look at the thing that God does that's so beautiful. He makes a declaration or he makes an installation, either one. He says in verse 6, which is the centerpiece of the psalm, Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Now certainly that could have meant some king, it might have been David, that was, was being installed in Jerusalem, but certainly it means much more than that. God the Father 
in response to the rage of the nations, or really not in response to it, but what provokes the rage of the nations, for really verse 6, is why the nations are raging in the first place, because he has set his king on his holy hill Zion. Now certainly we can take that literally and say that he set a king on Zion, which is the mountain that the Jebusites had and was conquered eventually by David, the mountain uh, that, uh, that uh, defines Jerusalem. But certainly means more than that. Zion always means not only the physical mountain, but the spiritual mountain, the place of God's dwelling. And so he's saying that God the Father is, I have set my king in my place, at my throne, at my right hand. And it's that setting the Messiah at the right hand of the Father, exalting him to the place of honor and glory that provokes the rage of the nations. This installation by the Father of the Son is cemented in covenant language. And in verse 7 we read, I will declare the decree. And now we see the Son, who is now the one being installed, speaking. The Lord, Yahweh, has said to me, Messiah, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now that's the crux of the whole psalm. Because the question is now, what relationship does the father have to the son? What exactly is the father doing in setting the son up? Who is this son anyway? Who is this Mashiach? And so he says, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now when we first read that as Americans, the first thing we're going to think is that this has something to do with genetics. That when God the Father begot the son, it had something to do with a father-son relationship, the father bearing the son, that the son carrying in his body the very seed of the Father, it's a relational genetic relationship. Now, of course, the early church struggled with this, and with this text in particular. Because if that was true, then the Messiah would have been somebody that was somewhat less than the Father. He couldn't have been fully God if he came out of the loins of the Father. And so he had early in the church's history what we call Arianism, where this man named Arius came up and said, of course he can't be God. Look at Psalm 2 and look at some other texts. This one called the Son is less than the Father. Yes, greater than anybody else, but less than the Father. And the church struggled with that. And the councils of Nicaea and uh, Ephesus and Chalcedon came finally to a, a firm conclusion that that he was uh, begotten, not made of one substance with the Father, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was truly God of God. He was everything God was. But actually, when we look at this, even from a Greek or a Hebrew perspective, and uh, in, in this psalm, obviously, a Hebrew perspective, what exactly is going on today, I've begotten you? And in both those cultures I just mentioned, whether it be Hebrew or Greek, because it's quoted in a Greek context, and we'll see that in just a moment, <clears throat> in both those cultures, a young man wasn't considered to be, in, in a sense, understand what I'm saying, a full human being until some event took place. That's why in Galatians chapter 3, it talks about the nation of Israel being no better than a servant until the day that they're declared to be an adult by the Father. And you got that cultural thing going on. So really what it's saying is that there is a specific event in, in a specific time where the Father declared the Son to be something he wasn't previously. That's the point. It's not talking about ontology. It's not talking about essence or makeup. It's talking about position. And so it's saying, today, I have begotten you. Now, how do I know that? I know that because look at the way that this verse three times is quoted 
in the New Testament. I turn your attention to Acts chapter 13. Paul's sermon to Pisidia at Antioch, and he's preaching. And he says in verse 32, And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, let's get it, raised up Jesus, resurrected Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You see, the apostle Paul is equating the resurrection of the son of God with the begetting in Psalm 2. It's the event of the resurrection that's in mind, at least in this particular text. But it goes even broader than that. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5, where it's quoted for the second time. And he's comparing, of course, the supremacy of Christ over the angels, that is the writer to the Hebrews. And he says in verse 5, to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And if you look at verse 4, the context is that in the Old Testament, the Messiah is given a name that's superior to any other being, whether it be angels or men or whoever, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. When is it that Jesus obtained that more excellent name than they? It says in Ephesians, uh, Philippians, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 8, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. It's at the cross where Jesus, in verse 9, was exalted by God the Father and given a name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. So again, we see the resurrection, the exaltation of the name of Jesus by virtue of his cross work are in mind by the New Testament writers. And then in chapter 5 of Hebrews, verse 5, he's talking about the high priesthood. So Christ also, this is 5.5, 5, so Christ also did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, the father who said to Jesus, the Mashiach, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And then he goes on to explain that Jesus is the only verifiable high priest of the new covenant. So going back to Psalm 2, what God does to answer the rage, of the, or what causes, excuse me, the rage of the nations is that God has installed at his right hand the one called Mashiach, and he uses the language of begetting. Begetting simply to mean it was at this time, at the, at the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and mediatorial glory of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ that he was established as, a, as the true and everlasting Son of God. Now, of course, he was always the Son of God. We're talking about office now. The office is now secure. And guess what? Now the nations see that. And guess what? Prompted by satanic forces and satanic energy, the nations now come against the Messiah. And that's exactly what we see today. And so we see that uh, what God does is he mocks the nations for their idiocy if we're trying to overtake him. And the thing that they really were warring against was his installation of this one called the Messiah. But what is the Messiah doing while he's sitting on the throne? Look at verse 8. Father saying, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. I have installed you as my son, the Mashiach, the one foretold by all the prophets and the law. And now, as the gift of your cross work, I give you the nations. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. And the ends of the earth 
for your possession. Now, if you stop right there, you might think that that's a gospel text. I'll give you the nations. They're going to they're gonna fall at the preaching of the gospel. I'm giving you so many that, that uh, no one can number of every tribe and kindred and tongue and nation. But actually, at this point in the psalm, that's not what he's saying. He gives them the nations in order that he can judge them. See, sometimes we like to eviscerate the, 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 the Bible and take out all the judgment stuff and want to make everything gospel. Yes, gospel's coming, but that's not what he's saying here. He says, you shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. In other words, the nations are raging against God because God has installed the Messiah at his right hand to rule the nations, and because the nations are raging, it's going to be the Son of God that's going to be the instrument of judgment against the warring nations. And don't we see that all throughout the Bible? He shall reign till I make your enemies your footstool. Psalm 110. It's throughout the Bible that Jesus Christ is coming in flaming fire, 2 Thessalonians 2, to judge the nations. He is the judge. That's what the text is saying. It's saying to drive the nations out of themselves and to stop the warring against the Messiah, to lay down the arms and to say, save us. Have you done that? Have you given up your rage against the Son of God? He is your judge. There's no getting around that. There is no other judge but Him. Have you laid down your arms to the Son? <clears throat> Interesting, in verse 9, just as an aside, <clears throat> that's the last... That's the last verse in this psalm that's quoted in the New Testament. It's quoted way back in Revelation chapter 2, verse 27, to the corrupt church of Thyatira. It's very interesting because there he's giving an encouragement to the overcomers of the apostate church. And he who overcomes and keeps my works and to the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He's not saying he'll give power over the nations to the Messiah. He's saying he's going to give power over the nations to the overcomer. That is to you and me that trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he quotes Psalm 2. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel. Isn't that interesting that the very thing that Jesus Christ is given the responsibility uniquely to do to judge the, the nations, he passes on to his people. Paul will say later on in one of the Corinthian epistles says that you will judge angels. You will be with me in the role of judging. To those that, that are uh, faithful little, I'll give faithful mother. If, if you're faithful in one city, I'll give you ten cities. And so on and so forth. But that's just an aside. But here in Psalm 8, it's clearly talking about the Messiah. He will break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now if we stop right there, that's a pretty bleak psalm. The nations are at war against God and his Messiah. God and his Messiah is at war, and they will win against the nations. And you can close the book and say, well, what hope do we have? But in verses 10 through 12, the psalmist gives us one of the great gospel invitations in all the Bible. I, I call this God at peace with the nations. Let me read those verses. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. You see the pleading there? He doesn't say, well, too bad, too sad, the Messiah, you're raging against God, I'm going to destroy the nations, I've given all authority to Jesus Christ, he will crush you like a fly, he will crush you like a potter's vessel, you have no hope. That's not what it says. Now, therefore, be wise, O king, be in the same ones again back in verse 1, 
And two, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges, which is a synonym for kings, of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. I want you to feel the force of what's going on here. The nations hate God. And since the installation of Messiah, the hatred against God has risen to newfound heights. We see it all across the world where Satan and the nations are rising up, whether it be false religions or immorality, whatever it might be, the world is a mess. They are aligning themselves against God. They have nothing to do with them. And God, in predicted uh, retaliation, if you will, is coming against the nations and he will win. But now at the end of the psalm, he starts to reach out to the very nations that hate him. I want you to notice uh, five calls that God makes. Number one, he calls them to be wise. He calls them to be wise. In other words, he doesn't just say, too late, too bad, too sad, you're out of luck, you guys hate me, I'm going to destroy you, I'm going to crush you. He said, will you consider and will you be wise? Now, this is not as easy as it sounds because we know that the wisdom of God is foolishness to man and the foolishness of man is the wisdom of God, the gospel. But he is appealing to them, rethink this thing. Think about what you need to do to be reconciled to me. Find wisdom. Of course, in Psalm 2, we don't really know what that wisdom is, but it takes us to the New Testament before we learn that the wisdom of God is Christ himself, the Messiah. For unto God he was made, Christ was made unto this wisdom of God. Sanctification and redemption. It's a call to be wise and to understand what God is doing in this Messiah. Secondly, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Well, I could just be mere Hebrew parallelism, but there seems to be a little bit difference there. He says, learn, learn of me. You're at war with me now. Learn who I am. Take every effort that you can possibly muster. Read every scripture you can find. Listen to every preacher you can. Find some way to learn who I am. Do you not see that this is an invitation for God to be reconciled to these warring nations? Be instructed, you judges of the earth. It's a call to wisdom, a call to instruction, thirdly, a call to obedience. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Now, not only does he call them to serve the Lord, but he tells them that in serving the Lord with fear, they will find the only true joy that they could ever experience. In other words, God isn't telling them to grit their teeth and somehow obey me, and it'll be a miserable experience, but you, you have to do that. In other words, he's offering them something far greater than anything they have now. He's offering them joy if they will but serve him. Psalm 28, verse, uh, Proverbs 28, uh, 14 says, Happy is the man who is always reverent. In other words, the man that fears God is the happy man, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. It's a call to wisdom. It's a call to instruction. It's a call to obedience. But here, fourthly and most beautifully, it's a call to intimacy. He says, kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. What he's saying there is absolutely amazing. He's saying that I know that you have raged against my 
son, you know that I am coming back after you as the king of kings and the lord of lords and the ruler of the universe. But now I'm calling you to an intimacy with me, which if you do will placate my wrath, and which if you don't do will cause my wrath to get worse and worse. Kiss the son, or else his anger will continue, even increase. He's calling the world to an intimacy with the son. What is more intimate in all of human relationships than the kiss? That's what makes it so tragic that the Son of God, the same Messiah, would have been betrayed by the most intimate of all human touches. Kiss the Son. Do you not see the gospel offering in this verse? You cut out verses 10 through 12, there's nothing for us. But God is now coming back at the nations and begging them not to fight against this Mashiach, this son, this Messiah, this anointed one, but to have intimacy with him. And if God is commanding us to have intimacy with the son, then therefore intimacy with the son must be possible and is certainly offered. My question to you tonight is, have you that intimacy with the Son of God? And that is really the only question you need to answer. Do you have intimacy with him? That's how you placate the wrath of God. By having intimacy with the Son of God. Without that intimacy, you are still under his wrath. That's why Christianity is not about facts. It's not about duty. It's not about doing or not doing. It's not about religion or no religion. It's not even about emotions. Christianity is about intimacy with the one who sits at the right hand of the Father and rules the world. Well, how then can I get that intimacy? It's not by accident. I don't think that the psalm ends with the clearest gospel message you could have in the Old Testament. Blessed, happy, in good place, in good form, in good shape, eternally blessed of God. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. We don't often trust the one who is enraged against us. Less often do we trust the one in whom we are enraged against. But in the economy of God, though we are enraged against him, the nations, and God is enraged against them, God nevertheless offers salvation to anybody who will come to this Mashiach, to this Son. And it's through, guess what? Trust, belief, casting your case completely and solely and exclusively on him. You remember the story of Esther, I'm sure. And Esther was married to a, a very, uh, should we say, uh, unpredictable king by the name of Ahasuerus. And one, and one time she was encouraged by her uncle Mordecai to save the people of Israel. You, you need to go in and uh, you, you, you need to talk to, you need to, you need to, talk to this, uh, this petulant king. And she said, if I do that, he's going to kill me. Uh, he, Mordecai said, you have no choice. He says, here, take the staff and, and uh, or, or go, go in. And if he puts the, the staff out, it shows that he has 
accepted you into his presence, which, which would have been a long shot. And she did that, and he put the staff out, and, and he accepted her. And if she was able to tell about the plight of her nation, and eventually Israel was saved. We know the story. It's the same thing here. Are you willing to go before this king that is angry, and legitimately so? You know, are you willing to come to him and say, Lord Mashiach, dear Jesus, the anointed one of God, we have enraged against you for many, 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 many years. You are rightly enraged against us. Would you please extend the scepter of forgiveness and be reconciled to us? And I might tell you on the authority of the word of God that Jesus has never turned anyone away yet. Neither will he turn you away or any of your friends or any of your family members, any of your associates, any of your children. If they will but come to this Savior and be saved. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. The nations are raging against God. God is raging against the nations. But most beautifully, God is ex extending the scepter of forgiveness to all who will come to him by faith. Father, thank you for Psalm 2. Thank you for the Messiah, high and lifted up, right now sitting at your right hand, not coming back yet because he is desired for men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, willing to receive anybody that comes to his throne, admit that they have been rebel sinners, have laid down their arms, have asked and begged for forgiveness. And we know that whosoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for saving the nations. Help us now to get out there and to invite people of every tribe and kindred and tongue and nation to come to this most gracious King even Lord Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.